Hello everyone. I welcome everybody on behalf of Medico International to today's event, which is called Solidarity Against the EU, EU Border Regime in the Sahara. Uh, I'm very happy that at least some of you found your way to this event today. We all see that the world is on fire, be it in Italy, in Pakistan, in Iran, and therefore I am very glad that at least some of you are also interested in a region which lies in the focus of repressive EU migration politics, but not in the focus of public attention. I especially welcome Dr. Aziz Shehu and Mokhtar Danyaye, who, who made their long way from Niger to Frankfurt. Welcome. Aziz and Mokhtar are both coordinators for Alam von Sahara, what this organization is. They will present it later. And of course, uh, the two of them, they just not, they not just came for this event, because on Monday, Medico International, Brot für die Welt, Miserio, and other organizations and NGOs organized a big conference about the state of emergency at the European borders about the breaches of basic human rights and law at the edges of the European Union. And in, Mon uh, in Berlin on Monday, more than 150 participants were there. It was, I think it was a great success um, to get so many people to such a topic in this situation, in this moment. But uh, I had the feeling that at the conference on Monday, everybody was also somehow depressed because of the election results of fascists and right-wing parties in Italy, which uh, especially will make the life of migrants and refugees even worse in Italy and even worse on their way via the Mediterranean Sea. And before we start, we are not that many people, but I would like to have a minute of remembrance for colleagues and partners who died in a really horrific car accident on 18th of August this year in Niger, in the region of Difa. I will read their names and then we will have some seconds of remembrance. Their names were Mustafa Musa Changari from Alternative Espace Citoyen, which is also a long time medico partner. Their names were Eric Camden. He works, he worked, used to work at the House of Migrants in Gao. Their names were Jibril Diado, Umaru Dankarami, Abdul Razak Abassa Niandu. Rest in power. Thank you very much. So today we'll talk about the situation in the Sahel region, especially the situation in Niger, which is in the center of European externalization politics. There was a law which is called 036-2015. It was implemented seven years ago and it somehow uh, criminalized and prohibited migration movements from Agadez, which is a city in the middle of Niger, towards the north of Niger. It criminalized migrants, it criminalized people who transport other people, and it criminalizes activists working for freedom of movement, such as you, such as members of the Alarm from Sahara. And there is a, another very recent development on July 15, 2022, a new so-called so operational partnership to combat smuggling between Frontex and the European Union capacity building mission in Niger was signed in, in Brussels in the presence of the Nigerian Minister of Interior. And this cooperation further st strengthens Frontex's role in the region and will further also increase repressive control of migration. 
So I, I think against this continuity of the externalization of the EU's external borders, it is very important to talk and work with activists from organizations like Alarm von Sahara, which Medico International is doing for some years now, because they document human rights violations in Niger and they also organize help. You can find some leaflets uh, outside. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe Sabine, you can hand them around to show they, which show what kind of work you're actually doing. So I will now give the floor to Aziz and Mokhtar. The plan is that we will uh, have, they will have a presentation for 40 to 45 minutes. And afterwards, we, will, we can have an open discussion and you can make some remarks, etc. And just uh, for your information, we are recording this event, but only the presentation and my uh, introduction remarks will be recorded. The rest, the discussions, the things you will say, they, we won't record that, so that you can be on the safe side. So, uh, Mokhtar and Aziz, it's really a pleasure to have you, to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, we well, are really happy to uh, meet you here in uh, Frankfurt. It's uh, our um, fifth step in Europe. So the organization um, is entitled Alarm for Sahara Info Tower. And uh, we are going to talk about the solidarity against EU border regimes in, um, in the Sahara. Thank you. So we we'll start by the context of uh, Niger since 2015. Um, before 2015, I would like to uh, point out that uh, a particular thing. At that moment, the movement of people inside the territory of Niger towards the migrant countries was not prohibited. People used to uh, work, to go at any time. They go to the Maghreb countries. They stay for a few periods, three months to six months, just the period between uh, winter seasons. They make income and come back to their uh, villages and uh, yeah, help with the uh, income that they have made abroad. Uh, the same situation is uh, what is uh, in African uh, countries in general, and especially in Okoas. If you look at the left part of the map, uh, we wanted to point out that the circular migration, which was um, uh, really uh, empowering the capacities of people, because they can move from the rural areas to the urban areas, or they can move from the country to another because they have strong links between uh, the communities living in their different areas uh, uh, because of the culture, some traditions, uh, and uh, trading, uh, agriculture, and especially for the herdmen who uh, don't have limits between countries with the animals. They go where there is a grass, there is where there, there is a water, so they don't have barrier. Uh, on the right part of the, the map, we want, you, we want you to see that there are some places which are uh, circled. So there are the places where there are um, uh, insecurity. When we consider uh, the border, the Libyan border, we know what Libya is since uh, the death of uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, the former president. There is no uh, authority, no state. Today there are two governments ruling Libya, and uh, because of this uh, empty condition that they found, there are a lot of weapons that are uh, uh, circulating inside Africa. And it's one of the cause of the uh, terrorism in the countries. Uh, and the other, at the uh, southern part, you can see uh, the Lake Chat, which is surrounded by four countries, Niger, Nigeria, Chad, and Cameroon. 
And this is the place for the refugees. It's agency of this uh, Boko Haram uh, uh, people who are uh, see, uh, who are disturbing the life of many people and uh, push them to leave their countries for other countries. So there are internal displacement and as well that we have external displacements. So those people living around the lecture, uh, they just move to uh, a safer place. And uh, uh, yeah, and the countries who are, who are arm open, they just give them the possibilities to stay there. And on the uh, western part, this is what we call the three borders, the borders of nature, Burkina Faso and Mali, where we have also the jihadist uh, issue and uh, uh, you know uh, what also uh, happened because of the pressure of these uh, um, terrorists uh, the politicians were not able to tackle the issue and then the result was some coup d'etats that we have seen in at least three countries Burkina Faso, Mali and uh, uh, Guinea Conakry so this um, situation should be understood as really a, a solution to some kind of threats, not these only related to security, but also uh, uh, due to the climate change. Because of the climate change, many people could not do the activities they used to do. Uh, farmers cannot farm because uh, they don't have uh, lands, they don't have possibilities to exploit their lands. Fishermen cannot uh, uh, do the fishing in some rivers because of the climate change. Um, and uh, as I say, as I say, the, the headmen also cannot say any longer because their animals have been stolen by uh, the jihadists and they were the only sources of revenue, so they could not stay uh, at the same place. So it's normal. You cannot uh, put fire in, um, in a house and ask the inhabitants of this house to stay where the, fire, the house is burning. This is the situation. But uh, uh, so when people try to move inside the uh, ECOWAS, which is the, uh, the Economical um, Commission of West African countries, there are a lot of uh, checkpoints on the, on the ways between uh, uh, towns uh, between international borders, and uh, there are a lot of equities. They are asked money, uh, even if you have your official documents, which are supposed to be the ID card or the passport and the health card. They are not really necessary. The uh, people in uniform continue asking uh, uh, money from the people. So, apart from the transportation fees that they have to pay people have to have much more money with them in their purses so that they can continue their, uh, their trip. Otherwise, they have to go back to their uh, places. And especially when people are moving to the north. So these uh, two pictures are the, are the pictures that we ourselves made when uh, we organized a mission. Uh, my colleague, Matko and me, from Niamey to Burkina Faso, which uh, is just 500 kilometers, but um, uh, on this very distance, you can find at least 20 checkpoints. 20 checkpoints, and at any checkpoint, people have to get off their buses, to be controlled by the policemen, to pay money, and then return to, the, to, uh, to get on the buses, and so on, until they reach Burkina Faso, or until they reach uh, Niamey. And we have experienced these situations to make sure that what people were reporting us is true. Um, uh, there are some international organizations who uh, pretend to help um, migrants, or we uh, think that they don't uh, help them, they just try to dissuade them from moving to the north. You can see uh, the message that they draw, they really say the message, are you a migrant in need? If you are a migrant in need, then we can help you. 
which means if you need to return to your country of origin, yes, we are ready to help you. But if you don't want to return, if you want to continue your trip, so we leave you by your own way. So you can see who they are. Um, on, the, uh, 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 on the message, you can see it's IOM. It was founded by uh, uh, United Nations. And uh, we also have uh, the other um, organization like uh, UNHCR, which is in charge of refugees in, in Niger. So all these activities, all this uh, hard behavior of the people towards the um, people who move started when the law 2015-036 was um, adopted by the Niger Assembly. But we think that it was not the will of our parliamentaries. It was just a need from the European Union because they want to control the European borders in the third countries. So uh, the impact of this law is that um, the law says uh, it fights against the human trafficking. And what does human trafficking mean in, uh, in, the, in this law? It means that any person who assists another person on move is considered to be a criminal. It means that if you have got a car, and you carry someone who is not from Niger in your car towards the north, you are a criminal. If you are a taxi driver, you carry a foreigner in, in your car, you are a criminal. If you are a taxi motor rider, and you take a, a, a person from a place to another who is not Nigerian, you are also a criminal. Uh, people who are selling food, when they sell food to these people, they are criminals. Uh, people who have got rent houses, if they give the opportunity to these people to live in their houses, they are criminals. The people saying credit cards uh, for cell phones are also considered to be criminals. So we really um, ask ourselves, what does criminality mean in this situation? It means that there should not be solidarity, something that we have inherited from our ancestors for centuries. Suddenly, people want us to stop this uh, solidarity because they want us to forbid people, to stop people, to block people from moving towards the north. And another thing that people don't know, people are moving to the north not exactly intending to reach Europe. Before the year 2015, uh, People really don't know. Most of people from West Africa don't really know that there is a possibility to come to Europe and stay. They go to Algeria or to Libya or to Morocco or Tunisia when there is possibility for them to get a seasonal job and then return to their countries. But it is with the impact of that law that suddenly people tried to cross the Mediterranean Sea and we know all what the results are. Uh, in uh, response to this uh, uh, crazy implementation of the law, there were many cars that were confiscated in the desert because the law, when it was uh, uh, adopted by the uh, parliament, there was, no, there was no communication around it. So people were doing their activities as usual. They used to carry people at the uh, uh, bus uh, uh, lorry park. They are registered. The city hall uh, receives the money uh, uh, as taxes that the drivers pay. And we know how many people are packed on the cars and they go uh, on their trip in numbers. Hundreds of vehicles can move together and under a military convoy, so there are less disappearances, there were no deaths, unless it's a natural death, and even if a car broke down in the desert, there is solidarity between drivers. So uh, the drivers were put in jail, the uh, passengers were taken uh, back to their place of departure, and the cars were confiscated. Imagine someone who has in the money had borrowed his own 404 car to support his, uh, his family 
And Mr. Tali will say the car does not belong to you anymore because you are a criminal, because you traffic people. Uh, a consequence of this uh, uh, 036 law is that some drivers become not some drivers. The, uh, the former actors of the migration, uh, 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 trusting the trust fund, trust fund, uh, the European trust, trust Fund, they accepted to change their activities under the compensation of the money. They are supposed to be paid one million five hundred safer, which they earn every week. And they say, we're going to give you this money and we are going to change your activities, which is not possible. Something who, someone who does never know another um, um, activity apart the migration, uh, transporting people, you ask the person to become a trader, to become, uh, to manage a restaurant or to sell clubs, it's not easy for the person, they just, those who got the money, uh, among 6,400 people who applied, only 3,360 got the possible response, and also these people spoiled quickly the money they had because it was nothing compared to what they used to get. And it also had a very bad impact on the economy of the city of Agadez. When there was a migration, People really uh, make money, and uh, uh, the life of the people was more or less comfortable. But now we have a lot of people who are li in the, living in hard poverty, and um, the, the, the former drivers stopped the activities. There are now new drivers and experienced drivers who take risky routes. They take risky routes and alone. And the consequence is, when they get blocked in the desert, no one can help them. Because we don't have enough places which are covered by the, uh, the network. They cannot go. It's not uh, uh, all of the time that they can also travel in the desert with the satellite phones. Because also, when other uh, users of this space, like uh, uh, drug dealers um, or terrorists meet them with uh, satellite phones, they think that they are also uh, part of the government. They would like to give the position of these people in the desert. So it's another issue they have to live. So the consequence is when we go into the desert, we find some graves of people who are dead and we cannot exactly say how many people died in the desert. Yeah, um, with the help of our partners, like Medical International, we organize some sort of uh, um, rescue missions or patrols, civilian patrols in the desert. And uh, when we come uh, across a body, most of the time, the people that we find don't have documents on them. The only thing to do is just to try to give them a, a, some sort of dignity and we cover the bodies and take the coordinates of the, the police and then, uh, yeah, continue uh, our discovery in the desert. So these people are what you call our whistleblowers. They are our collaborators. They are uh, located on the uh, migration routes. The migration routes we are talking about are the two principal uh, migration routes, one from Agadez to the border of Libya and another one from Agadez to the border of Algeria. Officially, these are the two routes, but now we have many, many routes that people take. Yeah, uh, I will let the floor to the to Mokta to continue about the, another aspect that is taking, uh, now, that is increasing in the desert. It's uh, the pushbacks from Algeria, as well as now the other uh, phase of that uh, pushback that we also observe from Libya. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Aziz, for uh, showing up <coughs> a bit the, consequent, uh, the context in which we are uh, working and the consequences of uh, the externalization of European border policy. Because what is shown right now is uh, the consequences on uh, people mobility in the region and uh, on the economy and also on people life on this particular part of uh, Africa and uh, in Niger. We, as uh, Alam from Sahara, this is uh, our objective, trying to have a response to uh, those consequences of uh, the European border uh, policy and their uh, consequences on Niger and uh, on the region itself. As he said, Apart from uh, those consequences since uh, 2015, or I can say after 2015, the so-called uh, migration crisis, it led uh, also the Maghreb countries to deal with the mobility of people, especially on sub-Saharan uh, people, how they want. And uh, since 2017, we are facing uh, a huge pushbacks from Algeria. From 2017 to now, I think it's almost uh, 40,000 people that Algeria pushed back uh, in Niger. So I will now show you a bit on how those pushbacks are organized and how it's happened. Because once we talk about uh, pushback, sometimes people think about deportation. It's uh, maybe one person or some people in um, air, take the person in airport and in plane and bring it to a, another East country, which is uh, very different. It's not the same. It's so inhuman the way that uh, Algeria is pushing back uh, sub-Saharan in the ground of uh, Niger. How it uh, happened, it, uh, since uh, 2017, as I said, uh, Algeria started gather all sub-Saharans that they found on their uh, country. It organized some patrol patrols in the villages. They call them wilaya. Uh, maybe some of you know some the district and border. And the consent, I can say, is only the color of skin. No matter uh, the place that they find the person, whether in his house or work uh, places, they gather them and once they have a number like 500, 600, 700, then they send them to the border of Niger. This picture to show how uh, Algerian uh, police or uh, military get the people in the in the villages or in the districts of Algeria, then once they have the number or that they are looking for, because usually it's uh, from 700 to 1,000 people that they bring, and uh, every week since 2017. Once they get them like this, they put them in kind of cars, like camion like this, for uh, Camions like this, not in bus or whatever, camions that's supposed to take goods, they put people inside. Women, men, young, elder people, they just throw them on those cars and throw them at the border between Algeria and Niger. You can see the point uh, here which shows the border between Niger and Algeria. If you look at the map, you can see that it's really in the desert. The, the place, the name is Point Zero. Point Zero is the border of between Niger and Algeria. And how it is, is just this uh, piece of iron that is set in uh, part of uh, the desert, which represents the border between Algeria and Niger. And at it's at this place that they let those migrants that they gathered 
late in the night, late in the night, around one or two, and they asked them to go to the direction of Niger. You can see also on the left part of uh, the map, I think there is, uh, okay, yeah, here is normally where is the uh, point zero. This iron is supposed to be here, between here and uh, here, which is uh, uh, the place, the, the, the border between Niger and Algeria. They led them here and they asked them to walk till Asamaka. Asamaka here is the first village of Niger. The distance between here, the point zero and Asamaka is almost 15 to 18 kilometers. So once they drop the people over there, they will ask them just to walk and go to Niger in the desert. And I want to maybe just explain that the condition in the, or the climate in the desert is very complicated. It's always extreme. When it's cold, it's extremely cold, and when it's warm, it's extremely warm. So then they ask people to walk in the night and without uh, without any, any uh, light, not light, like uh, something that house. No. Road. There is no road and uh, you have the indication. Okay. Sorry for the signs. signs to the first uh, village. So, I mean, 15 kilometers in the desert without any signs, so many people could lost and take other ways. And in the desert, if you take another way, it means that it's finished because this is uh, some, uh, the result of what he shown right now of, of, the, of the graves and other um, deaf body that our whistleblowers used to find in this uh, particular side of um, the desert. Then after they walk, they reach the village, the brave ones, those who are able to come to reach the village early in the morning because it depends always on the capacity of the, of the persons. Some will be able and others will let behind. So those who arrived in the village, this is how they get into the first village of Asamaka. You can see them, the young, they walk to They walk to the village of Asamaka. And once they arrived at Asamaka, the first point that they search is the police station, because this has, is the place that uh, they are registered. And it's from that place that we uh, have like the number of those who arrived. And we are document documenting those pushbacks since uh, 2019. We, at least, have 40, as I said first, since uh, 2019, and uh, we don't know exactly the number of the person that Algeria sent or they pushed back because there is no communication between Algeria uh, authorities and Niger authorities. Maybe to make it clear, I will explain that there is two kind of pushbacks, the one that we call official convoy and the non-official -con uh, convoy. The official convoy is the pushback of Niger people. Like uh, it was since 2014, Niger and Algeria had an agreement to send back the Nigerians to Niger. So this is official. Once it was, the convoy is only Nigerians, it's the Algerians bring them till Asamaka and handle them to the authority or the police of Niger. But one, it is the unofficial, which is which is com which combine all uh, sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, and other. Sometimes we even find Bangladesh and other in the convoy. They just let them at the point zero. So if they arrive, those who had to get some things like some kind of mattress because once they get them in the once they take them in the villages they seize all their goods and they don't let them to go and get what they 
economize because sometimes they are in Algeria almost two, three, four years. All their economy just abandoned over there and they send them over there uh, in Niger. And once they arrive, see the condition in which that they are count it's like prisoners, like uh, with no dignity, they send them like this and count them to have the number and uh, trying to send them uh, to Arlit, then Agadez, before Niger, because uh, how, because at Asamaka, you have the presence of IOEM. That's why in the first presentation, he is shown uh, the presence or the acting of uh, those international org organizing like IOEM, which support because there is no, and it's because of them that uh, Algeria is sending uh, or pushing uh, back the migrants, and they say that they will take care of them to send them to their uh, countries in their um, so-called uh, voluntary return program. So this is how they collect them and try to send them uh, in their different countries. Just this is a picture of uh, people coming. This was uh, in 2020. We went to Asamaka ourselves, and we uh, had contact with those migrant ones that are pushed back. And also sometimes uh, you hear that, okay, IOEM and other, they have a center, transit center in which they get, uh, they take care of the migrants or they try to give them dignity. People sometimes think that it's a, a maybe nice uh, places or a normal uh, center, but this is the shelter that IOEM had in Asamaka in 2020. So it is in this uh, shelter that they stay sometimes more than one week, two weeks before they organize their, their trip to Arlit, then Agadez, then Niamey, and so on. This process sometimes will take more than months, even trimester or semester, because actually uh, IOM is a bit overcrowded. They don't even know how to manage because of the number of migrants that are in their centers from Asamaka to Arlit, Agadez, and Niamey. They are overcrowded. And we always talk about uh, European uh, policy and uh, their responsibility is that with their finance that all these are happening. On this uh, map, you can see the, the sign of uh, the center and it's proudly shown that financed by Italian government and whatever. So meaning that all these things that we are saying is known by the governance, they even paid for how it is, uh, how it should be continued. So Alarm from Sahara is trying to, is regarding of what this, uh, is regarding of uh, this uh, situation that we uh, civil society uh, activists and uh, human rights defenders, especially on mobility, we decided to put up uh, our organization, Alam from Sahara, first to sensitize the international opinion and uh, uh, people about what is going on. Sensitize the opinion, sensitize also the migrant on their rights and trying to um, Rise awareness because we realized that since 2015, after the so called uh, immigration crisis, all is focused on the Mediterranean. Like the media, everyone is talking about what is going on uh, on the Mediterranean. They don't know that many things are happening before the Mediterranean. Death, human rights violations. Maybe what is happening before the Mediterranean is, is even more uh, dangerous and hard than the Mediterranean. So we uh, decided to give us our, this objective of sensitizing and also documenting. As I said, uh, we're trying to documenting the number of pushback, documenting the deaths and other, and also uh, documenting on the human rights violation that's happening on uh, this uh, region. And uh, our third uh, 
objective is to rescue because it's not sufficient only to denounce or to sensitize because people are continuing to be uh, violated their right and dying and so we give up also uh, ourselves this mission of trying to rescue people in this um, particular uh, region. On sensitization, the first uh, thing is to sensitize the migrants of maybe how to behave in the desert because we realize that many organizations, even the international uh, organ, organized institution, they sensitize, they say they sensitize, but we realize that their sensitization is to pursue, to deceive only the migrant to go toward, trying to sensitize them about on the risk and the danger, but it's not sufficient. And sometimes we find it even ridiculous because you try to sensitize somebody on the risk or uh, on the danger, you, in your uh, office, you never get to the desert. Maybe the migrant or the young that you try to tell him that it's risky, he tried it already twice, third time, and he maybe even see somebody that died behind him. So we think that this is sometimes even ridiculous. So we try to sensitize them on the danger, but by giving them advices on how to behave in case of they find themselves in a distress, like an example, or how to be prepared if they decided to take those risks. Our main uh, motto is free to move, free to stay. We don't want to discourage them to take the road, we don't also want to encourage them because we don't know what pushed the person to move. So just to try to save his life by giving him advices on how to behave in case of uh, he decided to take the road. That's our first um, flyer that we set up when we put, when we create, create found, uh, when we found Alam from Sahara. The second, which is uh, rescue. Now it's rescue and assistance because uh, rescue in the desert, okay. But since uh, the pandemic period, rescue is uh, a little less, but we face the problem of assisting them because uh, the country, as he showed it in the first uh, map, it became like a kind of uh, my like a hub of migrants which find themselves in a trap with all those crises that surrounding the country and uh, officially the borders that are closed due to COVID, so they find themselves stuck in uh, the country. So we had to assist them because the only way the international organization, which is uh, OEM, assist migrant it's once he accepts to return back to his home otherwise there is no support nothing to him nothing for him so we try to assist them with uh, also the our contribution of our partners like medico and temple and all that donation that we uh, gather and in the assistance the first project is the collective kitchen which is uh, each weekend, each Saturday, we invite a community of uh, migrants in Agadez, trying to bring them in our space, give them at least one meal a week. We know that it's not sufficient, but it, it's important and it's let them know that, okay, they are considered by some people and to give them a space to have even a smile once a week, change, exchange, and discuss with them. And it's also for us an occasion to spread our information, our numbers, and uh, also try to gather sometimes their testimonies and their true story. Because we, as Alam from Sahara, we try to be uh, the eyes, the ear, and the mouth of migrants. 
Many people talk about migrants, whether uh, journalists, and researcher, other organization, but they don't give the voice to migrants themselves to speak. And sometimes people gather information and or they talk about information on migrants, they are not even in direct contact with migrants. So we try to get these uh, spaces to have direct information from migrants. And we know that, okay, it's not uh, something that uh, is um, maybe manipulated because we realize that sometimes if uh, journalists or researchers want to have maybe an interview or research on migrants, to get them, it's a difficult from the uh, international organization. And even if they get them, sometimes it, it's some migrants that are prepared on how to speak to them. So we give free spaces for uh, journalists, for researcher to get in touch directly with migrants without any intervention between them so that they will be free to say what they are uh, living in. And also it's a, a occasion for us to try to find co so social cohesion between the uh, migrant and the local community. The motto of uh, this uh, collective kitchen is, in French, maybe I will read it, un repas collectif avec les migrants vaut mille fois des mesures collectives contre les migrants. So this is a kind of things that we do as assistance for migrants. And uh, the rescue mission, or the sauvetage, come as in, we say in French, this is how our whistleblowers help the migrants. As uh, my colleague first said, there is two main routes from Agadez, one from the uh, one toward Algeria, one toward Libya. And the name Alarm Phone Sahara is a sister project of Alarm Phone Mediterranean, which exists uh, since. We wanted to have a troll number, a phone number, which migrants or someone in distress in desert can call to reach us so that we assist them. But finally, we realized that it's not sufficient because of the situation of um, the desert. Not all the part of the desert is covered by network. Then we uh, find this uh, strategy to have a network of whistleblower. Whistleblower is some people, voluntary, which are uh, on different villages that are on those roads from Agadez to Algeria or from Agadez to Libya, which they know more the region. And sometimes they did those patrol. patrol. If they found a car or people or migrants in distress, they try to help them. Because as he said first at the beginning, migration was a natural phenomenon. It's something that people do you usually on their daily work. The cars used to leave Agadez in convey, sometimes 40, 30, 20, towards uh, Algeria or towards Libya. But since the application of this law, when it became criminalized, so it stopped. But it can't stop the migration itself because people always try to find their own way to get toward uh, the north. So which make uh, the risk of death of or of disappearance increase because once a car takes his own road, he takes his own road, it depends. Even a small break, a, a tire problem, it's finished because no one can help me, him and no one will follow this road. So that will lead uh, to death. So our whistleblowers sometimes um, make patrols and you can see here on the picture, like this car, it's only stopped. Like it's stuck in the sand, but if you don't have the experience or help to push and to get it out, people will just die because it's very difficult. No one can live in the desert maybe two or three days after. The most of the death is from dehydration, which is the biggest problem, and uh, that's it. You can see here. So we used to assist them. The first uh, thing, sometimes some small snacks or. Uh, the whistleblowers, as I said, they are from the region, so they know more uh, where they can find the nearest 
point to have maybe a well for fetching water or if it is a, a car broke to help them to get maybe where to repair or find a new uh, spare pass or even as uh, we have, we have uh, coordination they know in at this place where to move to get network connection maybe to inform the coordinator or the other member of Alam from Sahara so that we decide how to help them. Yeah, and uh, on those, uh, the part from Algeria side, as we, he shown the point zero and at the place that they let migrant to work from point zero to Asamaka, which is almost 15 to 18 kilometers. We decided that, okay, we can't stay like this because once they have some migrants come at least to find a way to search for, uh, if there are not migrants that left behind or migrants that cannot work to come to the village of Asamaka. We wanted to have a car. Maybe it's more practical with even uh, Medico International, that is uh, our partner. But the condition of the place, we shown at the beginning the crisis and uh, other security issue, make that is not even easy to have it. At a certain time, uh, the international organization, because of our denunciation and uh, what we said, they had, uh, they finally got a lorry and they tried to make this um, patrol when uh, they send or they push back uh, migrants. But unfortunately, we found that it's not enough because they don't have, they don't do much patrol because we seen it in our mission and also the way that they do it it's even traumatized the migrant because they went uh, in this patrol with militaries and soldiers so which by seeing them the the, the migrant is more even traumatized even if they need help but it's not good but finally we said okay maybe with the support of uh, some partners we finally uh, have this uh, tree cycle which is uh, less uh, dangerous maybe or is more secure and we uh, try to make any every time some kind of navet once we have uh, this information that uh, they push back some migrants try to find whether there is no one left behind or if there is someone that is sick that can't work and at, at this moment even the lorry of uh, the international uh, organization broke so meaning that, meaning that it's not continuing his work. So we are doing it uh, with our capacity and also not even to make those patrol between uh, Asamaka and the point zero. Even in Asamaka, the police station, sometimes when uh, a migrant is sick or he can't walk, they used to call uh, our whistleblower to come and take him maybe from uh, the police station to uh, the medical center or um, something like that, depending. Yeah. So at the uh, end, I think this is uh, a bit of our work and what we're doing. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.